Welcome to Stelligence DevOps on AWS Radio. Welcome to our 27th episode of DevOps on AWS Radio. I'm Scott Alexander, Senior DevOps Automation Engineer at Stelligent. My co-host is Shag Evans. Hi, Scott. I'm Shag Evans. I've been the head of IP and open source at Stelligent the last couple of months. Uh, you can listen to our previous episodes by searching for DevOps on AWS Radio or going straight to Stelligent's blog at stelligent.com slash blog. We are currently on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and we are being reviewed to get on the Google Play podcast catalog. Glad to hear we're getting that one fixed. In this episode, we are talking about Mutato, Stelligent's newest open source product. We're also going to have a discussion about some key changes on the DevOps landscape on AWS and how they impact you. First, an update on the podcast. Shag? It was run for years by Paul Duvall along with Brian Jakovich. We ended up sort of accidentally retiring that version of it at the end of last year. Stelligent was acquired by Emphasis Corporation in early 2019. And as part of that process, Paul moved on and uh, became more of an AWS evangelist within Emphasis and also started writing a book. As part of that process, uh, the ability to publish a podcast at the same time faded. And so a month or two ago, uh, Paul and I were talking and some renewed interest in the podcast came up. And after talking it through, we eventually got to the point where Paul realized it's, it's a really nice platform as a voice in the DevOps community. And Paul wanted to be able to let other engineers leverage that. So he encouraged us to take it and run with it. And, uh, you know, we see it as, as just a great opportunity to continue to get the message out about the things Stelligent cares about and the, the parts of the DevOps AWS world that we like to speak to and work in. And so here we are. And that, that was when you came to me and we started chatting about this idea in the podcast. We, we came up with a couple ideas that we wanted to flip around, change up, and just see, you know, what, what if we were a little bit more flexible with how we put this podcast together in recognition of having uh, some new people on. And so we'll be switching a little bit of it up. One of them is that the format's flipped. We're actually going to be jumping into our interview first. Whoever our interviewer or our interviewee is of the episode, we're going to jump right into hearing from that person because that's, that's what we think is the most valuable piece of information we're delivering on each podcast is that interview content. We're also going to switch around news instead of it being more of a laundry list. When Paul started it, there were not many places to get DevOps news about what was happening on AWS. And that has changed substantially. There's a lot more information out there. Uh, it's much easier to get the information about how DevOps on AWS is changing. And so we're going to try and have a little bit more of a focused discussion about some of the news, maybe a key item that's in it for AWS instead of just a list of all the important announcements. Now, as I said, we're going straight to the interview. Joining me now on the podcast is Michael Neal. Uh, Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been at Stelligent. Hey, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. So I've been at Stelligent for uh, 19 or 20 months. It feels like about two years. I know I'm getting close here. I run our team over at 3M. We do some work over there. And uh, we have about 10 engineers on, on it. And I deal with that contract and automation, helping them um, do work on AWS. Right now we're in the middle of a a big, uh, they announced an IT is moving over to AWS. And so we're kind of assisting a little bit uh, with that shift. Cool. Sounds like a really interesting project to be involved with. You're here today, though, not to talk about that project, but instead it's a new announcement of an open source project that Stelligent's putting out there. What is it and what does it do? Sure. Yeah. So the project is called Mutato and it is uh, it's a CI CD uh, tool for deploying your microservices. Uh, so if you work with Docker or you want to build microservices, a hot thing, it helps you orchestrate those applications on ECS. Uh, so it's ECS with Fargate, uh, ECS, you can technically do EKS on Fargate, um, Spotfleet, and any of the services, I guess, uh, revolving around ECS. All right. And then it just helps 
get the containers out there. So it's it's deployment automation. Who really is this targeted at? What caused us to go chase this and say, we want to actually create a new product in this space? We kind of have a product in the space already, and it was called uh, Mew, or it still is called Mew. And so that's kind of where the name Mutato came from. Mew was written in Go, and it uses uh, the AWS Go SDK. And it was really cumbersome to kind of maintain for us. But also, um, because we're the only people maintaining it, it was uh, difficult to add features, right? I mean, it takes a lot of work to maintain these types of products. And since that product that came out from us, we've, we've seen the CDK kind of take off. Um, so AWS's Cloud Developer Kit, which is uh, written primarily in TypeScript and then ported to other languages, uh, does a lot of the things that um, Mew already did. But much in AWS fashion, it's a bunch of building blocks that you can compose together. And it gives you, uh, you know, just, it's, it's kind of difficult to get going. If you're not a, an engineer and you don't know TypeScript, which is the, the best documented uh, version of the CDK. If you don't know those two things, it can be really difficult to get started with it. Um, on top of that, if you've never used AWS or you're new to microservices and you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how do I use Docker? How do I uh, write my application? How do I deploy it to Lambda? How do I deploy it to Fargate? And what is CloudFormation? And I'm trying to learn CDK all at the same time. It's way too much information um, to take in at once. The idea came kind of from a bunch of work that we've been doing uh, as far as migrations and getting engineers on board, you know, taking people who have very little uh, experience with AWS, at, but also for people who have a lot, but, but mostly for people who don't have a ton of experience with AWS and maybe don't know how to use the CDK, but they want to get up and running quick and they want to do everything the right way, um, then they would, they would be the people who would look towards Mutato. And I think that's one thing it's really easy to overlook is that new experience, somebody who's just having to do this for the first time and how much they have to learn before they can be proficient. So I always like hearing about tools that are built from that perspective of it makes it easier for somebody to focus on their job, what it is they're supposed to be doing and pulls a bunch of these other things out of the way and takes care of them for them as much as possible. What about for the engineers who do understand more of what's going on? How, how experienced, like how's an experienced engineer going to handle Mutato and being able to control everything they want to control? Do they have options there as well? Oh yeah. So again, the, the target is kind of people getting started looking at this project and saying, okay, there's so much stuff to learn here. I just want to learn this one. Um, and we have a DSL. So it's a declarative language. You can, write it out and say, I want to scaffold my app this way. Uh, but once you've gone past that point, once you're like, okay, I've got my app up, I have it configured, I have the settings I want to use here, and now I want to go a little bit deeper, uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's an amalgamation of CDK constructs that we've kind of wrapped together and wired, wired for you. Uh, we've stuck together code pipeline with ECS, with spot fleets, and we can orchestrate all these together, generate database passwords for you in the background and uh, automatically link your application service over to the database. Once you've got all that stuff together and you need a little bit more control, let's say you want to go the next step and you want to run an SQS queue, or you have an older EC2 instance that you need to connect out to and you want to bring it into the system. With CDK, you can actually NPM install Mutato and bring it in as a regular CDK, a, a package of constructs that you can use to kind of um, wrap into your own CDK app. So if you're an engineer and you know TypeScript and you just want to get at it, you can install it straight from NPM. Uh, you can import the packages there and the wiring and stuff can still be done. Uh, so you can do the declarative language. You can, you can use our helpers to import that. You can configure your own application with our own DSL. So things that are often difficult that we found uh, with CDK, just using it and writing it, is oftentimes people have trouble with, well, how do I inject parameters or how do I parameterize this app or how do I, how do I, it's great that I wrote this construct that, that can be reused, but now how do I actually go about reusing it? And that's where Mutato comes back in for the experienced engineer. And it's like, this is, this is a good way to basically configure all of your code that you wrote. You've wrote all this imperative code, but now you need a way to reuse it and package it up. 
the by including Mutato into it, you get access to that kind of DSL structure that will configure and wire together your CDK apps with you uh, automatically. And that's so important when people think about it. Uh, just to, okay, how do I generate my database password? And that was a challenge we had with uh, CloudFormation actually for quite some time. And it was well into secrets being out and fully supported before we saw a solution out there. So it's nice to hear right at the beginning, things like passwords are already built in because as we know, we're focusing a lot, not just on DevOps, but also security being a part of that pipeline, the DevSecOps movement uh, and having that as part of our pipelines. What about security in Mutato? How, how much can I add in here to increase security of the applications that are being deployed when I'm using Mutato? So that's a great question. And there's a lot of nuanced answers to that. I mean, one of the first things that Mutato handles for you is access. You've got to deploy all these applications or you want to deploy, let's say, a single Docker image to ECS. Well, that image probably has to do other things. Maybe it's accessible to the internet. Uh, you don't want to deploy it straight into a front end subnet and open it up to the world and say, hey, everyone, you know, start sending me requests. Uh, best practice is to stick it into a back end subnet, wire up a load balancer, put it in a front end, put a WAF on the load balancer, and make sure that all the requests coming in are secure. Also, things like security groups uh, are important, and these things are all handled for you by Mutato uh, by default. Uh, other things that you have to deal with whenever you're working inside of AWS is the identity access manager. What roles does my container need? What other services am I doing? If I'm connecting to a database, well, now I need an IAM policy that's going to allow me to manage that database, but you can accidentally give it something that's too permissive. You don't need access to all of RDS. You only need access to your one database. So Mutato scopes these roles down um, as minimal as possible to allow your application to function without giving it uh, too permissive uh, policies or, or access. Uh, we're also, something that isn't quite available yet, but, but we're hoping to get out soon is, is things like ECR uh, image scanning. So when you build your images and push them up, it'll automatically scan your image. That's a feature that's built into Amazon. It's something that you could do. Uh, it's not a first class thing yet, but you could do that with Mutato as well. You know, that that's a nice little transition into another question, which is the future roadmap. What is the development team, the group that's putting Mutato together, looking for not just today, but into the future? Here's where we think we can add even more value to this product. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that we're currently focused on right now is metrics and monitoring. Uh, that's something that people like to think about, or often you go to a third party and you have to wire all this extra stuff in. And it can be really difficult to work with um, the dashboards, CloudWatch dashboards, CloudWatch logs, they're great services, they're integrated, you get them with AWS as soon as you launch stuff, but actually using them, making them useful, getting your alerts, um, knowing what actually went wrong whenever something breaks is uh, difficult and it, it takes some work to get spun up. So we're working on dashboards that will automatically monitor the health of your pipelines, monitor the health of your application, let you know when things go down um, by generating alerts or sending off SNS topics. That's uh, kind of our main focus right now. And our current roadmap, we're doing quarter by quarter, and that's public. It's on GitHub as a GitHub project, as well as our whole backlog for what it is that we're working on. So all the other ideas that we have, we continue to reprioritize them uh, throughout the, the months as we work on it. And those are also available as a next project in GitHub. Cool. And I, it's nice to hear that it's already out there public and ready to go so people can get in there, get involved, and see what's on the roadmap. Are there issues, say somebody hears about this product and they're just like, hey, this is something I want to get involved with. They try it out. They love it. How do I help? What, what does someone like that do? How do they jump in and start contributing to the project? Yeah. Uh, again, so it's on, it's on GitHub uh, under, under Stelligent's account. So it's Stelligent Mutato. That's M-U-T-A-T-O. And uh, you, can, can, you can fork the project, work on it, and open pull requests. We have a backlog of issues already there. So if they see something that uh, you want to look at that maybe interests you, that looks like an issue that you want to tackle, that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, you can work on our current roadmap. Or if you just want something that you feel like it's missing, uh, open an issue, let's discuss it. And then we can see if it's a feature that either we can add or maybe it's something you tackle yourself. I know on a number of our other projects, I've seen support for dev containers. 
are you using that within Mutato yet? Yeah, so we started out with dev containers and uh, to be specific there, that's uh, the Visual Studio Code's remote uh, Docker execution. And so it's remote, but technically it, uh, it isn't because it's on the same machine. So you can start up with a dev container there if you're using VS Code. It's already configured, uh, so you would clone it. There is no prerequisites. You can uh, clone the project, open it in the dev container, run uh, NPM test or NPX test, and it will run the full test suite, and it should pass. Yep, and that's, I, I know it comes from Visual Studio, but there's, I've found them useful just as standalones when I needed to be able to just test something out locally uh, with some of the other projects, just be able to grab that dev container that's already built, ready to go and published on Docker Hub. It saved me the time of having to even do the installation and build because I knew I had a source that I could just start off with uh, and wrap it. So I, I really appreciate projects that put time into things like the dev containers, just because they make it easier for everyone, even if, you're, even if they're not using Visual Studio Code. Now, if I just want to see the project, I, I want to try out this pipeline. What, what do I do? How do I jump in and try this project? Uh, yeah, so the, there's documentation on GitHub pages. Again, if you go to the um, GitHub project, you'll find the pages link. And we have documentation on getting started. It's pretty easy. The quick start guide is to install uh, our Docker image. That's pretty much our main requirement is that you have to have Docker. So you install a Docker image that's public on Docker Hub. And once that's installed, uh, you write a mutato.yaml file. And this YAML file declares a few things. Uh, it declares an environment that you want to deploy to. Uh, you have to have one, but you can have as many as you want. So you can deploy to multiple regions. Um, we don't support multiple accounts yet, but that is something on the roadmap. So you can, you can choose your environments that you want to deploy to. You can group resources by environments. So you can deploy a VPC here. You can deploy RDS over there. You can deploy Nginx and, and your backend sort of Rails app uh, in another region. You can deploy them all in the same if you want. So you configure your YAML file, which by default, I think the example just uh, throws an Nginx image up. And when you run this through the Docker image, so you, you feed it your Mutato YAML file, it's a one line snippet of code. It's not very complex. You copy paste it from the examples. And what you're going to get is you're going to get a VPC with a front end and back end subnet. You're going to get security groups. You're going to get uh, internet gateway. You're going to get a NAT gateway. You get uh, an application load balancer, and it's you're going to get an endpoint that you open your browser to and go to, and, and the Nginx container will be stood up, and you got a Hello World page. I mentioned a lot of resources there, and I know that those aren't necessarily required for every single application, and you can go back and tailor that as needed, um, but that's the default uh, that you'll get spun up whenever you have to, or whenever you go through the getting started. And again, doing all that stuff is very complicated. And it seems like uh, all I want to do is I want to take this container and I want to stick it on AWS. And you don't realize how many resources you actually need and what all needs to be configured to get that done. Uh, and so that's that's what Mutato is taking care of for you just out of the box. Sounds incredible, Michael. And it's great to hear about a new way that's making container deployment easier for all of our end users. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And with that, I'll let you get back to it. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm lucky to have Shag with me today to talk more about open source Stelligent. Uh, Mutato isn't our only product that we actually have in the open source space. So Shag, what else do we have out there and how are we seeing it be used? Our most popular open source project is CFN NAG. Uh, one of our principal engineers, Eric Kasich, uh, wrote it for one of our engagements a few years ago. And, um, you know, it's, I think it's one that's kind of a shining example for us. Amazon tends to include it in slides at reInvent. Uh, I know it was on Warner Vogel's keynote slides at last reInvent in 2019. It's built into some of their solutions. And so, you know, as an AWS premier consulting partner, that just makes us feel really proud of our work, right? That's where I first heard of Stelligent was the CFN NAG product. For a lot of people, that may be the first they hear about Stelligent is they're looking for a way to secure their pipelines and try and protect uh, them from launching non-compliant resources with cloud formation. And so they find CFN NAG and then they hear about Stelligent kind of addition, you know, in addition to the tool. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's one of those tools that's easy to integrate into your workflow because it's, 
it follows that Unix philosophy where, you know, do one specific thing and do it well. And, um, you know, in that sense, it's, it's easy to add to what you already have. You don't have to rework everything else. If you have a pipeline, if you have code you're publishing, you can just throw that in and, you know, you've got one more early check so you can fail, fail early on some of the things that you care about that you're auditing. Now that's cloud formation. What about uh, Terraform? What do we have for Terraform users? So Terraform, we have a similar, uh, similarly focused product called Config Lint. Uh, it also came out of some work for uh, customer engagement, uh, and it's it's a little more of a flexible tool in that you can use it to audit text files like JSON and YAML. Uh, but its real its key strength is doing static analysis of Terraform rules in AWS. Although you can also apply it to Terraform rules in you know if you're using the Azure provider or something else, you could use it for Kubernetes files. Uh, but Terraform AWS is really its key strength. Similar static analysis kind of focus though. Wow, those are those are both really big tools and great ways to get get the word out. Are, is that the only open source we do here? Or what, what other ways are we uh, putting software out there in the open source world? Yeah, so our chief avenue for publishing it, I'd say, aside from just putting things up at github.com slash Stelligent, is really announcing things on our blog and it's not like our focus is so much the open source itself as it's us ruminating on DevOps in the cloud. And what is, you know, what does that mean from a technical, like deeply technical engineer's perspective? So recently, Eric Kasich, the author of CFN NAG, wrote an article talking about code complexity and how you could apply the principles of code complexity to I am policies in Amazon. So if you have a cloud formation template that has a number of I am rules or uh, policies, what could you do to figure out if they're overly complex, you know, because it affects how you maintain these things over time and what kind of confidence you have that they're doing what you really think they're doing. Um, so, you know, from an open source perspective, Eric's thought process was, hey, this is something the world could use what can I do to raise a discussion about it? And as he did that, as a side effect of his blog post, he wrote code and he published that in our GitHub account. And you know, so we end up with a lot of open source that comes out as side effects of that. And you know, from that perspective, we've got hundreds of open source repos in our GitHub accounts, um, but only a handful of them I think are really core projects for us, you know, things that we focus on all the time and get, you know, they're active. We get GitHub issues filed, uh, you know, feature requests every week. So, yeah. And that one's quite the topic. I was actually in a conversation with some other engineers and we're talking on infrastructure as code and the complexity, the more code like it is, uh, the more programming that is integrated there the more difficult it is for somebody to be able to look at it and know what's actually going to happen. And that same thing is absolutely true with IAM. Eric makes a great point there. The, the harder it is to be able to see policy and understand it, the more likely it is that something isn't quite working as you intended and maybe you're giving too much permission without realizing it. So that, that's a great post and a great tool by the sounds of it to be able to evaluate how well you understand your IAM policies and give ideas of where, where you might look for issues. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think it speaks to kind of this fundamental concern with confidence that what you think you're doing with your IAC is what's really happening in, uh, you know, your cloud environment. And, you know, it's a challenge, I think, for anybody moving into the cloud. But, you know, it's a reality when you're there and you're experienced there as well. And, you know, this just gives us another framework, I think, to think about those challenges. And in that sense, you know, I, I really like the, the voice that Eric brings to our blog. There's another uh, article that came out recently that, that kind of leverages some of Eric's other work. Uh, it was an article by Todd Wells talking about Potemkin Decorator. And, um, you know, speaking of testing your code, it gives you a way to do lightweight, efficient integration testing of your AWS resources. Um, it's a Python module. It's available in the Python package index. 
um, but Todd's article, you know, talks about ways to leverage it uh, efficiently. Because once you start doing integration testing, um, you know, it, the time it takes to spin up test resources to validate your code, um, you know, it can be too indeterminate and it becomes impractical when you're deploying a lot of resources and you want to do that kind of validation of a lot of them. You know, I think a lot of people just just give up once they once they see how long that kind of testing takes. <laughs> it sounds, you know, it's, it's that challenge of unit testing, static testing that's really simple and tries to focus just on the isolatable pieces of code versus the full live testing where people are actually looking at it or automated tools are looking at it, trying to bridge that gap with something in between to be able to do additional testing before it gets out to the world. Yeah, I think so. And I think a lot of that, it's, it's symbolic of how far we've come as a DevOps industry where, um, you know, there's so much focus, uh, you know, I've seen lately on high quality unit testing and, uh, you know, low impact uh, integration testing and just finding every single thing, you know, every way that you can test and making it automatic. So you don't have to think about it. It's just part of your workflow and it just builds so much confidence in what you're deploying. Um, that once you've done it, you know, it's, it, I think it's hard to, hard to do things any other way. There's a lot of conversation just happening in the world now, I think, around kind of that aspect of it that really reflects how far we've come as an industry too. Yeah, it reminds me early 2013, probably, uh, you know, I was just hearing about DevOps really for the first time. And I had an opportunity to hear Jez Humble speak up at Nike when he was visiting there. And it just opened my eyes to this whole other strategy of how to go about releasing software and how much that, that automation has to be the key center of everything that we do when it comes to software development. And the more testing we can put into our automation, the better the end product. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's been fun to, to see how the world's matured in that regard. I my journey has been really similar. I heard Gene Kim speak at a puppet conference in San Diego, uh, right around the same time. And, uh, you know, reading his, uh, the Phoenix project. And then the book he wrote after that was it changed the way you think about the ways you manage your software. And once you start getting your hands into just automating everything, um, yeah, you, you just don't want to go back. You know, speaking of the blog, I know you were involved with a whole series that we just had come out about remote work. And obviously that was with the coronavirus, a lot of companies got surprised and we're trying to figure out how, how to work from home. Tell us about that series. What all's in there? What kind of posts and who should be looking at that? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, that uh, means a lot to me personally. I've been a telecommuter most of my career um, since the mid nineties. And uh, you know, working at Stelligent has just been an incredible part of that because our whole company is remote first. We do go to client sites, we're consultants, uh, you know, and it makes a, makes a difference to, to meet with your teams face to face. But by default, we work from home. And, uh, you know, when you do that, it changes the way you communicate. Uh, we live in Slack and G Suite. And every time we have a meeting, you know, we assume that everybody's remote. And that, that's a very different, different sort of uh, working assumption about communication than when you're one person, but everybody else is in the office. Um, you're never the afterthought uh, on the polycom phone. Um, you know, and so from that perspective, I feel like Stelligent, who has been a remote first company for a number of years, has a unique perspective on what it's like to run a remote first or remote only company. And so we have a series of blog posts that just take some of the experience that we've pulled together over years of doing this. And, um, you know, we're trying to speak to kind of our best practices, the things we've learned, you know, insights about hiring, insights about managing people remotely, talking about what it's like to work with clients who maybe aren't quite so comfortable with a remote team. Uh, you know, I think that's a common challenge we face. Um, you know, we're remote first. We're very comfortable with it. But maybe the maybe our clients who don't know us too well yet aren't real comfortable with that. Maybe it's not part of their culture. So, uh, you know, we we talk to concerns like that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the series. I, I think there's some great insight there. And we've had a chance to surface the voices of more of our engineers as authors. 
And, uh, you know, I really, really like reading the perspective of our engineers on this. Uh, you know, it just makes me proud of us as a group. So. Very cool. I know in the episode, Michael and I were talking about dev containers and we actually have a whole series of blog posts. There's two of them that are already published and a third one will be coming out maybe at the end of May on the topic of dev containers and how to get them set up for your project. And that is one, as, as I mentioned in that interview, I find them to be an incredibly useful tool, even though I don't use Visual Studio Code that often. Um, so if anybody heard dev containers and wants to know more, we've got blog posts about that uh, that are available. And also one that's coming out is about sandboxes within AWS accounts for developers, where you have uh, maybe a team of, of developers that are all working together and they have a test account that they're they're trying things out and how to actually set up a sandbox so they can share that account and not be stepping on each other's feet. If anything else, take a moment and read that for the introduction that Scott Nixon wrote for it. It's actually all about just identification and the, the history of kind of how we ended up with identi identity documents a little bit, uh, which is just a fascinating look. It, totally unexpected to be able to have that introduction in there. Yeah, that's good to hear. I haven't read it yet, but I was talking to Scott the other day about his own just kind of pro long professional interest in um, identity providers and, you know, that sort of corner of our industry. So, so I'm glad to hear he's, he's got a way to add a unique perspective to it. Yep. He managed to actually work uh, Frank Sinatra into it of all people. <laughs> that's impressive. All right. All right. I'm intrigued. But you'll have to read the blog post once when when it's available. Take yeah. a look for that one. I'll wait till it drops. Yeah. Shag, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. What's the best way for anyone who wants to get in touch with you to reach out? I would say probably Twitter. You can find me on O'Shaughnessy with an O-H. Uh, that's a complicated one to spell. So uh, I'm sure you can drop it in the show notes for us. Yeah, I think that one's the best place to put those. And my, my Twitter handle isn't much better. So I'll put it in the show notes, but it's S Alex PDX, which was the airport code I was sitting in when I was setting up that Twitter account. That wraps up our 27th episode. Thank you for joining us as we continue our efforts to improve the software delivery process through DevOps on AWS. Thanks for listening. For the latest from Stelligent on AWS DevOps and being a remote-first company, see stelligent.com slash blog.